Bible series. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I've loved this series. I think it's been a great kickoff to Elevate. I think it's been a great opportunity to uh, what we've been talking about in groups. Um, I know some of you have mentioned, um, like, what does revival look like in my own life? Or, you know, some of you have said that you've been around the faith for a bit and you feel like you've strayed a little bit and you, now you want to know, um, how do I get back to the revival that I once had? How do I get that fire back? Um, and I think God's using this, this whole series um, one through, through Cody uh, for you guys, because as I was studying about revival and, and in preparation for this message, um, God was just speaking that he wants revival for you, and what revival looks like is going to look like a little bit different for all of you, but he ultimately what that means is he wants to connect with you. He wants a real, deep, intimate relationship with you, just like you have with your friends, just like what you have with your family, all of that. So I'm excited for it. So if you remember the first week, we learned that revival is, has a few definitions. It's like rebirth, regeneration, renewal, um, resurrection. Um, and tonight I want to add another definition to your tool belt. You've probably heard about it before. But it's this big word that we're all really scared of, and it's the word repentance. And repentance is the act of changing one's mind. Repentance is the act of changing one's mind. So what, one way you used to think this way, and now you think this way. That is, that is repentance. I'm going this way, I'm thinking this way, I'm, so I'm doing these things. Now I repent of doing this way, thinking this way. Now I go this way, so I think this way, and do this way's thing. Does that make sense? Sorry, that was a lot of fists and things going on there. But So, this week we are talking about revival is repentance. Revival is repentance. So these words describing revival of rebirth, regeneration, renewal, it, it reveals that it starts with something that is dead, something that is without hope, something that is without life. And um, quite simply, this was you or I right now or was you or I. And, um, and so spiritually speaking, this is, this is what the Bible talks about in 1 Peter Chapter 2, verse 10, it says, Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And Ephesians 2, 1 through 2, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And again, we see in Colossians 2, 13, when you were dead in your, in your sins and in your uncircumcision of your flesh. So obviously, we either are currently or were dead, spiritually dead in our faith. So this brings about a couple different questions. First of all, what the heck does that even mean, right? Second of all, does it mean you were just spiritually dead once and for all? Like, this is it, period, the end, done? Or, you know... Some of us, again, who have been around the faith a little bit, maybe have experienced revival and are wondering, can I get this same fire back? Is this something that's attainable again? How did I get it in the first place? What does this even look like? Well, let's look at what Paul has to say. So if you, would, you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 8. Romans 8. In verse 1, we see, Therefore, there is now no condemnation, for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. All right, there's a lot going on there, so I want to break it down. First of all, he's talking about those who are in Christ Jesus. Who are those in Christ Jesus? Quite simply, those who are, they are the ones who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and are faithfully walking with him. Got that? Good? All right. Then Paul starts contrasting these two laws, contrasting these two laws, right? So he's one, he's talking about the law of the Spirit, Okay, law of the spirit, that's law number one. And then he's talking about the law of sin and death. All right, so the law of the spirit is exactly what you may have already been kind of thinking about. It is the gospel. It is the good news that Jesus has come. He has died on the cross for our sins and was raised again and, and sits in the throne with the Father. 
The law of the sin and death is, was given in the Old Testament to Moses, and the, this law is holy. It is righteous, it is good, it is just, but because we cannot keep God's law on our own, the result is sin and death. Okay? So, why did God give this law in the first place then? If it's only going to result in sin and death, why, is, why did God give this law to Moses in the Old Testament? Well, there's many different reasons. One, because he's a great God, and so he just brought Jesus and had it all planned out from the very beginning. But two, the most important, God gave us a law to reveal his holiness, his standard of holiness. Here is God. This is his standard of holiness. And he uses this law so that it would convict us of our true guilt. I have sinned. You are here, God. This is your absolute standard of righteousness, and I am here. I cannot meet that law. I cannot meet that. So he brought this law so that it would convict us of our true guilt before him, and we would see our desperate need for the gospel. Without this law, the law of the Spirit bringing Jesus into the picture would have done nothing. I mean, it just, it just wouldn't mean anything without the context of the law of sin and death, meaning that when the law of sin and death came, we could not keep that law. And so therefore, God brought Jesus, and Jesus was the fulfillment of that law, meaning now you can keep that law because he lives within you. All right, got that? Does that make sense? You understand the two differences there? Law of the Spirit and law of sin and death? Okay. Now let's, let's pick back up in verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh. Hold on, I want to pause right there. Does everyone understand what living according to the flesh is? Sinful desires, flesh, what we desire, right? A desire that is basically disobedient to God, right? Okay, cool. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds, listen to this, he's going to be talking about the mind here. Minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in according with the Spirit, accordance with the Spirit, have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it keep God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So remember the definition of repentance. It is the act of changing one's mind. Check this out. God has given us Jesus so that we would repent from living according to the flesh. So we were going this way. We were following the flesh's desires. Our mind was set on flesh. We were doing anything we wanted. It was disobedient to God, and we were doing whatever we wanted. Now I repent. And from living according to the flesh, which leads to sin and gives birth to death. So God has given us Jesus so that we would do that. Okay? When we repent and begin living in accordance with the Spirit, we experience life, peace, and ultimately revival. So I was going this way. I was following fleshly desires. I was thinking about myself. I was thinking about my, my pride and my ego, and, and I was envious of all these things, and I wanted money, and I wanted everything. I wanted fame. I wanted all this. And say, no more. Not my life, Lord. I'm going to lay it down. I'm not going that way. I repent, and I'm now picking up your way of doing things. I'm now doing your way of life, the way you've created it. And so now I'm going to think in the Spirit. I'm going to think your way, Lord, and now I'm going to live your way. Because the way we think is ultimately the what we do. Right? It starts up here and then it comes out here, meaning what I think is now what I do. So what we're thinking is how the life we're going to live. So when we repent and begin living in accordance with the Spirit, we experience life, peace, and revival. Verse 9, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. So if, you, if the God... If, the Spirit of God lives in you. You are no longer doing the things of the world. You are no longer in part of the realm of the flesh. You are now in the realm of the Spirit. You are doing the things of God, the things of the kingdom. This is your main priority. This is the thoughts. You are consumed by this. 
And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. So the question is, how do I know the Spirit of God lives within me? Right? So check this out. In Acts 2, verses 37 and 38, Peter and the apostles are preaching to those around him, preaching the gospel. And when the people heard it, they were cut to the heart. They were, they were convicted of their sin. And they, they asked Peter, brother, what should we do? He said, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. So the Spirit of God lives in you when you have accepted Jesus as your Savior. Savior, For the forgiveness of your sins. And... You have repented of your sin, and then you are baptized. So he says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's pick up in verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So heirs. This is talking about the queen, right? Heirs of the throne. So what was your family, what you have been adopted into, your family, you have now received an inheritance. You have received an inheritance if you have accepted Jesus as your Savior and you have repented of your sin and are now baptized, and Jesus lives in you, you have now received an inheritance of the eternal life. Eternal life that Jesus has given you. And that can never be taken away from you. It will never fade. Nothing will ever happen. You have received an inheritance. It is written down. It is yours. Nobody can take it. It is your inheritance. So, as I was studying about revival and, um, and this idea, um, I was interested to find out more, just kind of advancing my knowledge a little bit or checking what I knew already, maybe. I don't know. Anyways, it's about how the revival of the winter season into the spring. Okay, so just in the world, we see, it, we see winter into spring. That is how seasons work, if you weren't aware. Cool. So... Um, and in this idea, I don't know if you know this, maybe you do, maybe you're just more brilliant, um, or you remember it from science class. I kind of had to do a double check on this, but did you know that the earth is actually closest to the sun in the winter? Yeah, show of hands, you guys know that? Maybe? Fun fact, now you know. Yeah, the earth is actually closest to the sun in the winter. And the misconception is that when we're closest to the sun in the winter, you're like, okay, then why is it like 20 degrees out? right? Well, it has to do with the the way that the earth is tilted. So in the winter, we are tilted away from the sun, so it is colder. And when it's in the summer, we are tilted towards the sun. And so this whole idea was, um, you know, just kind of interesting. And I was thinking about two things in particular. One being, I'm always kind of like a what-if guy, right? Like, what if we didn't have an earth that tilted? Which is just be interesting. I don't know. So I thought about that a little bit more. It's like, well, if we didn't have an earth that tilted, I guess we probably wouldn't have seasons, I guess. 
And in, re- in response to that, then if we didn't have seasons, then we wouldn't be able to see this beautiful transformation of dead and brown and gray in the wintertime to this beautiful full of life and color and vibrant, just like awesomeness in the spring, which is this crazy concept, which maybe some of you guys aren't in awe of God's creation. No harm, no foul. But um, I am. And so when I see this happen, it is awesome. And it reminds me of two things. So I had two points based on this. This is just two sub points. It reminds me of two things. One, my life is full of seasons. What does that mean? Well, sometimes life is going to be pretty awful. Just going to say it. The world's full of sin. We experience suffering. It is what it is. The world's going to be like, sometimes our seasons are not so good. And then we have seasons of great, just like awesomeness. And we are just excited and joyful all the time. And so it just reminds me that life is full of seasons, and things change, and things shift, and things move, and, and so God's given us this picture of, of his creation, of what our spiritual life looks like. The second thing is, um, and now I just lost my train of thought, but the second thing uh, is, <laughs> so in this transition between winter and spring, we see this transformation. So not only is my life full of seasons, but I also see this transformation from dead hopelessness and brownness to this full of life, which represents what Jesus did in my life. And so not only will I see, do I see the picture of God using seasons in my life, but I also see God using what he did in my very own life when I first met him. And so God, God took my hopelessness, my sin, my, my disastrous life, and, and made it full of hope, full of life, full of awesomeness. That's what spring is all about. Back to my second main point. Sometimes I think as Christians we feel that we're really close to God. And um, I don't think this metaphor just goes fully all around, but just the way God was working in my mind at this time. But sometimes I think that we're super close to God, and then a, a life-altering event happens, like we lose a family member or we lose our job or, or just something crazy happens, and it, it, it rocks our faith. Like we're really not sure what we're going to be doing next. And we're questioning God about how, you know, what he's doing and just really not understanding and as I was thinking about this and it's earth, the earth's rotation, I couldn't help but think about how in the wintertime, we are, we are closest to God, right? So it should be warmer, but it's, it's flip-flopped. And I thought about it, it's like, well, it's not about how close you are to the source of life. It's actually where your eyes are focused. And it's exactly what Abby was talking about, and it kind of blew me away back there. Because God included this, and I thought all this was kind of silly. I was just going to get rid of it because you guys were going to think it was meaningless. And so here it is. But so it's this crazy concept that it's not actually how close you are to the source of life, not actually how close you are to God, but it's actually where your eyes are fixed. Or in other words, where this metaphor comes is where your axis is pointed towards. So if, you're pointed, if your eyes are pointed to the Lord, you're actually going to walk closer to him. Even though it, it, it may look... And again, this metaphor breaks down somewhere, right? But you get, you get what I'm saying, right? Does that make sense? Like sometimes it feels like we're, we're close, but it's not about that. It's about where your eyes are. In other words, here's an example. You guys, some of you guys were just at Momentum Youth Conference this summer. You can be so close to God, what must be like, you know, thousands of students that are, that are pursuing the Lord, and you just feel him and all of this. But if your eyes aren't on Jesus, you're not getting anything out of that week, Does that make sense? You can be so close to the Lord in your word every morning. You can be so close to the Lord in your worship every day. But if you are not looking and and being aware of him, all of that box check, all of that checking the box doesn't matter. It's not actually fulfilling your faith. It's not actually taking you to that next step. So in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, Abby started it. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. 
It's just so interesting that he chose eyes. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Why not feet? Fixing our feet on Jesus. Wherever Jesus goes, I go. I mean, I get it, but think about it. I mean, we, you guys have heard the example before that like when you're driving, wherever you're looking is where you're going. The eyes are our are, are navigation to where we're moving towards. And so it doesn't matter where you know, our feet might be pointed or whatever. Wherever our eyes are looking, that's eventually where our feet are going to go. That's where we're going to go. So he says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. There's a part I want to read in Ephesians 2. In Ephesians 1 through 4, he talks about how, again, we were dead in our transgressions, in the way we used to live in the world. In verse 4, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Again, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God. Not by works that no one can boast. And in verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In verse 6 and 7, we see that God has raised us up and he wants to use you and I. And he says, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So be prepared for God to use you. Be prepared for God to use your story. He's written it just for you. And he's going to show it to the world. He's going to use you to express his kindness and his grace to other people. I always said this, and write this down, you may be the only Bible someone ever reads. What does that mean? You may be the only Bible that someone ever reads. They may, may not ever pick up a physical copy of the Bible. But by the way you live your life, by the way you talk, by the way you act, by the decisions you make, you are a representation of the Bible. You are a representation of Christ. You may be the only Bible someone ever reads. And God has given you a gift. And this gift is to be His handiwork. What does that mean? It is handiwork to do good works that He has already prepared for you so that He would be glorified. I want to finish with this. My questions, right? What does all this mean? Are we spiritually dead once and for all? Can we work to earn spiritual life? Maybe we've drifted away and now we're wondering how do we come back? Well, I want to answer all these questions. All of this means that when we repent and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and we are baptized, we experience revival. We are bapt when we repent and baptize, we experience the Lord. We are given the gift of the Holy Spirit, as it is said in Acts 2. Are we spiritually dead once and for all? No. Not spiritually dead once and for all. That is why, as we talked about in Romans 8, Jesus has been the fulfillment. He is, he is the one that has made it possible. That him dying on the cross and rising again has given us the opportunity to experience revival. And no, you cannot work to earn spiritual life as we saw in Ephesians 2. It is a gift given to you. You just simply have to accept it. And yes, 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 revival is experienced every day. It is experienced in our connection with God. It is in the Word in the morning. It is in the Word in the evening. It is in our spiritual worship throughout the day. It is our awareness of what is He doing in my life? What is He doing in the lives around me? It is how we quite literally experience revival.
Revival is repentance. It starts there. Repentance, then we experience revival. Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. And receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. At that point, that's when we experience revival. And from then on, we get to experience revival every single day. Because God's always doing a new thing. And He's doing it through you, and He's doing it through me. I want to end with this. There should be a sticky note underneath your chair with a pen. And if there's not um, a pen, I think that I have pens just in the second row. So you might have to share for the two guys in the third row. Leaders, if you want a sticky note too, I can give you one. What we're going to do with these sticky notes, there's, you should have two. So originally, I think God's changing my mind on how exactly we want to do this. It's going to have you just use both of them. And anyways, let me just explain how God wants to do it. So, you have two. The first one, I want us to, I want us to experience revival. And where does that start? It starts with repentance. And so, if there are things in your life right now that is, is standing in the way of you experiencing Christ, or has been a, a sin that, is, that has entangled you for a very long time, I want you to write that down on that first piece of paper. Think about it. Pray about it. Give you a minute or two. The thing about repentance, as you're writing your word down or words or whatever you're writing down. The thing about repentance, it is, it is not a, a constant U-turn. So I'm over here living the ways of the world, and, I, ret- and I, I go back here, and now I'm living in the ways of the Spirit. My mind is set on Christ. I don't, I don't turn back. I don't turn back. I am focused on the kingdom. There is no like sort of reach back while also following God. Mm-mm. You're, you're all in. You're all in or nothing from this. There is no lukewarm Christian. There is no doing the things of the world while also trying to follow Jesus. There is not that. Jesus said, I'd rather you not follow me if you're not going to follow me, if you're not going to follow me full heartedly. It's all in. This is an all in type of thing. And we'll give you another minute here. Write down. And then on the second piece of paper, I want you to write either an action you're going to take that that shows your your direction change. So I was doing this thing. Now I'm going to do this thing. I want you to fill its place. Okay? So I was, say, not that it's a sin, but something you're experiencing, depression. Now I'm choosing joy. What does that look like? Write down an action that you're going to do this week, and I want you to start that. We're real here. We talk about real things. If you are have an addiction to pornography, I'm going to set up blockers, and I'm no longer doing that. I'm now following the ways of the Lord. Set up an action. Got it? Does that make sense? All right. I think most of you are done. What I'm going to do is pray quick and then... What I want you to do is take that first piece of paper off, and I want you to crumple it up, and I want you to bring it to the stage. Nobody's going to read it. It's going to get thrown out, but I want you to bring it to the stage. You can do it now if you're ready, whatever you want to do. And then the second one, I want you to keep it. I want you to keep it in a place at home 
that you see every single day. When you wake up, that's what you see. Got that? All right, you can do that now, and then I'm going to pray over us. So congratulations, you have now made the first step towards revival. This is where revival begins. Oh my goodness, words tonight. This is where revival begins. It starts with repentance. And if you haven't been baptized yet, and that's something you want to pursue, maybe take some time, think about it, look in the Word, whatever. I want you to approach myself or one of the leaders, and we'll just talk about it. Just try to understand, what does it mean? Baptism is simply a public declaration of, I am laying my life down, Some of you guys come here to church on Sunday mornings. We have a baptism room back here. You are fully immersed in water for like 0.2 seconds. You go down. It is a public representation of I'm no longer living to myself. I'm dying to my old self, my old ways, my old thoughts, my desires. And now I'm being raised again in new life. And now I am living, I was doing over here. Now I'm going this way. Now I'm living in the spirit. I'm living in the spirit's minds. I'm consumed with his desires. So if if that's you... Don't have to do anything right now. Just come and see one of us if that's something you want to look into, talk about, see what the word has to say about it. But it's repent and be baptized. It's not any different than what Peter had said in Acts 2. It's the same thing. And that's exactly how they experienced revival then, and that's how we experience revival now. It starts with repentance.